fit the bill? Well, I think Quantumania uh, is very much an Ant-Man movie. We continue the story of the Langs and the Pims and the Van Dynes and tell that family story and, and just sort of progress the story, the family dynamics. But this time we take them deep down into the quantum realm, further than they've ever been. Uh, so really, the Ant-Man movies have always been about family, so it's telling the story, the generational story of this family of heroes, but now putting them up against the most formidable villain they've ever faced, and that's Kang the Conqueror. How has Scott's role as a superhero changed since the first Ant-Man? When we shot the first Ant-Man, you know, Scott Lang was an ex-con who was down on his luck. He would made some bad choices, but he was really operating outside of the Avengers. He was really playing in the margins. Now, by the time we're in our third Ant-Man movie with Quantumania, um, he's a full-fledged Avenger. And in fact, he's written a book about the battle with Thanos and his rise to becoming a hero. Uh, but now we're going to put him front and center in Quantumania. Ant Man and Wasp were the first Avengers to face off with Kang the Conqueror. So it's been fun to see Scott Lang move from someone who was outside of the Avengers to now being front and center. Describe the dynamic between Scott and Cassie now that she's grown up. The Scott Cassie Lang dynamic has always been the central relationship in the Ant Man movies. Uh, his biggest priority in life is to be a good father to his daughter, and he's lost a lot of time with her over the years. Uh, now, as a result of the uh, events of Avengers Endgame, he's lost another five years, and Cassie's no longer a little girl. She's an 18-year-old young woman. So I think Scott maybe still relates to her as, as a girl at times, and he has to learn to accept that she has her own ideas uh, about how to make her way in the world and her finding her voice as a hero and the idea that maybe she has some very different ideas than her dad has about being a hero, and she can, in fact, be quite critical of him. So it was fun to sort of play out that dynamic between father-daughter and, and to grow and progress that relationship, and also to play out the arc of, uh, throughout the events of Quantumania, Cassie becoming a hero in her own right. When Janet returns from the quantum realm, about 30 years, what is she like and how does that impact her relationship with her daughter, Hope? In the last movie in Ant-Man and the Wasp, uh, Hank and Hope successfully rescue Janet Van Dyne from the quantum realm. She's been there for 30 years and I think for Hope Van Dyne, she had this expectation, I'm gonna get to know my mom again, you know, and, and we're gonna be able to catch up and have conversations about what her life was like down there and what, uh, what Hope's life was like up here and maybe even get some advice about how to be a hero. But we like the idea of what would happen if maybe Janet put up a little bit of a wall and is not willing to talk about her time down there. Maybe she can't, you know, maybe there's a little bit of PTSD. Uh, and the movie really uh, deals with the idea that she's put her past behind her, but of course, the past is never done with you, and she has to confront her past uh, in a very real way. And what if her past included a confrontation with Kang the Conqueror? Uh, that was something that we really, uh, was central to the story of Quantumania. How would you describe the quantum realm and its potential impact on the MCU moving forward? The Quantum Realm has always been a part of the Ant-Man movies. We introduced it in the first Ant-Man and then uh, sent Hank Pym down to rescue Janet Van Dyne in Ant-Man and the Wasp, but this time we take the audience full on into the Quantum Realm and experience it and live there for a while. And also to sort of answer some of the questions about what it was Janet Van Dyne was doing down there for 30 years and who she was down there. You know, we, we introduced her in this movie serving pizza to her family in a really domestic situation which is nice, she's got some good family time, but uh, after they're thrown into the quantum realm, we really start to see Janet come back to life and, and rediscover who she was down there and, and confront her past. Um, so that was exciting for us, and also the idea that the quantum realm was really the thing that Scott Lang was able to use to help defeat Thanos in Avengers Endgame. So the quantum realm is really uh, our corner of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that the Ant-Man movies have been to, able to play around with, but we really bring it to life in a really vivid fashion in this movie. Who is Kang the Conqueror and why is he such a formidable villain? Uh, I grew up reading the Marvel comics and I always loved Kang the Conqueror in the comic book, so it was a big challenge, uh, which I was really excited to, to uh, bring to the MCU, to create Kang the Conqueror in the movies. Uh, and fortunately, we cast Jonathan Majors in the role, and Jonathan is, uh, he's a force of nature. We needed someone to play Kang who was a, a physically imposing character. He's, he's a villain who has dominion over time. He's a time traveler. 
he doesn't experience life in a straight line, uh, past, present, and future. He sort of lives these these multiple timelines, and uh, he's had all these experiences, and uh, he's he's a kind of a broken man, a man who lives outside of time. So uh, we wanted to make him the most powerful villain that uh, Scott and Hope have ever come up against. And also we kick off phase five with Kang the Conqueror. And one of, I think, the unique things about Kang is he's battling our heroes, but we come to find out he's also at war with different versions of himself, his variants. How did Hope, Scott, Janet, Hank, and Cassie end up in the Quantum Realm, and what is their plan once there? Uh, very early on in Quantumania, uh, Cassie Lang has been studying with uh, Hank Pym and has gone through a lot of his journals over the five years where everybody was gone and uh, has become quite a uh, knowledgeable quantum physicist on her, in her own right. She's created a device that allows them to not go into the quantum realm, but to be able to map it out. And I think she sort of lives with that loss of her dad for five years. And she says, you know, if, if I had been able to invent this earlier, maybe I could have found you in the quantum realm. What happens, though, is that device sends a signal into the quantum realm, which is picked up on the other end by some, uh, some dark forces. And what happens is it sends a signal out, and it immediately thrusts our heroes down into the quantum realm. They had no idea they were going down there. They never wanted to go back. Uh, but they're forced to be down there now, and, and they, uh, we find out that the reason they were thrust down there is uh, someone down there who needs them, and maybe in particular needs Scott Lang and his ability to uh, acquire things. So it's a bit of a quantum realm heist, uh, and that someone is Kang the Conqueror. Is the di dynamic different on this third installment since you've worked with many of the cast and the crew members before? Uh, I think what's fun about having been able to do a trilogy of Ant-Man movies is we've been doing this for uh, eight or nine years, and uh, Paul, Michael, Evangeline, uh, Michelle, and uh, now Catherine Newton and Jonathan Majors, you know, we've sort of formed this ant family and, and we've been doing it together for a while and the movie really is all about family and family dynamics and behind the scenes we have our own family dynamics. So that's been fun is to sort of like see everybody in their real life grow as we've, uh, you know, grown the family in the movies themselves. So to be able to do a third one and then really blow it out and create this sort of epic, crazy uh, family trip gone wrong uh, was really, really fun. What do you think will most surprise audiences about this film? <clears throat> I think going into any of these movies, the biggest thing you want to do is surprise the audience. The worst thing you can do is to bore an audience or show them something that they've seen before. So uh, as we took this movie and our characters into the quantum realm, I really wanted to finally present the quantum realm in all its glory. You know, we dipped our toe into it in the first movie and a little bit more in the second movie. But this time, the bulk of the movie takes place there. So we were able to work with a team of incredible visual artists and, of course, visual effects artists to, to really bring the quantum realm to life. So I think that's something that, uh, as our heroes find these unexpected characters and situations down there, we're going to take the audience down with us. And, and uh, you know, we shot the movie in large format IMAX. So uh, creating that world and all the crazy uh, inhabitants of that world was one of the biggest things that uh, uh, hopefully the audience will be thrilled with.